So in this video, we're going to talk about hydrogen induced coal cracking. A big subject, especially within the weld inspection courses, as it drives and uh, affects all of our controls that we're going to have in place uh, throughout every stage of welding. As we set up, we immediately before welding, during welding, and then after. And it will help us decide the risk of failure and when we do our MDT delay, i.e. 24, 48 or 72 hours after we finish welding. So as a in this video, we're just going to cover the basic concept. What is the key points you need to know? So when you go for your course, then you, you're already a little bit ahead. So with the basic concept, imagine a triangle bit like the fire triangle where we need three things uh, to cause hydrogen juice coal cracking. The first one is we need a hydrogen content. We need a stress and we need a susceptible microstructure. All of those come together in a temperature beneath 300 degrees and then we get the risk of hydrogen juice coal cracking. So, where do we get our hydrogen content from? Well, shielding gas in certain electrodes, like cellulosic electrodes. Now, if you haven't already watched it, we have a video on uh, manual metal arc, which covers the different types of uh, welding electrodes and, and their hydrogen contents. But cellulosic electrodes need a hydrogen rich shielding gas to allow deep penetration. So we're building up a hydrogen content there. We also get moisture in our fluxes. So we are introducing water, which of course has hydrogen in it. We have moisture, water, uh, hydrogen in, our, in the air. So the longer welding arcs we have, the more chance we have of mixing up atmosphere into a welding arc. And we also have oils and greases, paints, contamination on the uh, plate surface. Now what happens is if we allow that hydrogen to mix up within our welding arc, our welding arc is about 6,000 degrees Celsius at those sorts of temperatures, hydrogen H2 splits to form atomic hydrogen, which are single hydrogen atoms. They are very diffusible within the base material in the weld pool. So they, they fly about and they mix up and they get in, get into everything. If the material, when, when the material solidifies and if it's still above 300 degrees Celsius, what happens is that hydrogen is able to diffuse and leave our base material. If that happens, we end up with a really low hydrogen content and we've removed that top section of our triangle. So we're unlikely to get hydrogen cracking. However, if the material cools beneath 300 degrees and we have trapped hydrogen within the grain structure, that forms back to H2, which is what we call molecular hydrogen. And that becomes trapped and starts to drive embrittlement within our structure. And that's where we get trapped hydrogen making the top side of our triangle there. If we look at our microstructure, okay, so a susceptible microstructure is anything that has a hardness. So I'm measuring in hardness vicus here above 400. And that's normally characterized as being a martensitic grain structure. Martensite is really good for wear resistance, but it's not really something we want in our welds uh, because it's fairly brittle. So martensite is easy to produce in steels or easier to produce in steels as we increase the carbon equivalent value. And our carbon equivalent value is is this uh, equation. You wouldn't need to know this equation off by heart for, a, say, a C-SWIP examination, 
but you need to know it exists and what, what it's doing. So here we've got a carbon percentage of our steel adding up with all of our alloying, other alloying elements, and that will give us a number, a carbon equivalent value. Now, when we have a carbon equivalent value, a higher value indicates a more brittle structure and easier to crack, and a lower value drives you know, more easily weldable structure. And we can capture all of that in a, a, a word called weldability. So if we have a good weldability, we tend to have a low carbon equivalent. A poor weldability tends to be up on the carbon equivalent. So the likelihood of it cracking without additional control. Now we can drive martensitic structures by losing control in our welding processes or not putting controls in place. So if we have low preheats, uh, we start with a cold material or we have thick material, low heat inputs and quenched, quenching our steels uh, will all drive fast cooling rates. Fast cooling rate, martensitic structure. A high CEV with a cooling rate that's not long enough will drive a martensitic structure. And that's very susceptible because it's brittle. We also need a, a stress, something to drive prop, uh, crack propagation. So here we get our stress from residual stresses in our welds, which, which naturally happen. You know, we clamp our steel down. We don't want it to distort when we're welding. So that raises the residual stress levels. If we have poor fit up in our weld, uh, so if we have had to pull steel into place, the steel doesn't want to stay where we've put it to weld. It wants to move back to where it's relaxed. So that will drive stress. Heat inputs, especially if they're uneven or unbalanced, can drive different movements in the steel. And a lack of preheat drives a concentrate in the amount of stress we have in certain areas and not allowing that material to move during uh, during cooling or welding also drives residual stress but of course we don't want the material to move normally because then we have distortion so we're always going to create an amount of residual stress so that's it that's what we have there that's our very quick overview of hydrogen induced core cracking where we have a hydrogen content, a susceptible microstructure, and an applied stress. When we get those acting together in a material beneath, which has dropped beneath 300 degrees, we can drive hydrogen juice core cracking. And now that can normally be from the toes of the welds, because that's where we have higher stress concentrations. But in high CEV materials, low alloy steels, that could actually happen through the weld metal itself, wherever it's more susceptible and the stress is applied, basically. So, I hope that helps. And you'll definitely learn more when you come and sit one of our courses or one of the, the Institute's courses. And I hope that gives you a, a, a good grounding and an understanding of at least of the basics.